accomplish that in our lives. I'd invite you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we will be there shortly. You've probably heard many times that we all need to have a give-and-take mentality. Well, the truth of the matter is we do all give and take, and there's a, there is a lot of truth in that, that idea. Perhaps you've even heard that applied to what needs to be done to have a successful marriage. The husband and wife both need to give and take. And again, I won't argue that there's not some truth to that, but I believe a better way to approach marriage really is to have a give and give mindset. Because anyone who goes into a marriage thinking about what they can take from it rather than what they can give to it, they're headed for some major disappointments and probably a disastrous marriage. Because marriage is not a 50-50 relationship. A successful, successful marriage comes when both spouses are giving 100% to their marriage. But we're not here to talk about marriage today. <laughs> but this, this same truth applies to a local church. We've examined the qualifications and the function of elders, the qualities and ministries that the elders bring to the congregation and this morning, we're going to begin looking at the congregation's part in this relationship between the congregation and elders. What does the congregation bring into this relationship in order to bring God's blessing upon the local church? Before we get into the message, uh, let's just briefly review the, the function of elders that we looked at a couple of weeks ago. We saw that an elder is to oversee the local church, which involves both superintending and ruling. Elders in a church need, need the guidance from the scripture and they need the Holy Spirit as together, being spiritually mature leaders, they, they give direction to the congregation as they seek to glorify God. They don't lord it over them, but they lead them. We also saw that an elder is not only an overseer in the local church, but he's also a shepherd of the local church, which includes his preaching and teaching ministry. We saw that every elder, uh, a qualification is that he must be able to teach the word of God. And we also noted that some elders are occupied with teaching and preaching. We noted that teaching and preaching includes exhortation, rebuke, and admonition. Not only are elders to shepherd by teaching and preaching, they're also to shepherd by protecting the church from spiritual predators, both from within and from without. And finally, that they need to be praying for the needs of the congregation, all kinds of needs, spiritual, physical, etc., let me just read this one quote from Strzok in his book on biblical leadership. He says, as Christ's under shepherds and God's stewards, the elders are under the strict authority of Jesus Christ and his holy word. They are not a ruling oligarchy. They cannot do or say whatever they want. The church does not belong to the elders. It is Christ's church and God's flock. Thus, the elders' leadership is to be exercised in a way that models Christ-like, humble, loving leadership. And that's really a, a very concise and good summary of, of you know, what we looked at regarding the function of an elder. Well, let's turn our attention to the congregation's part in this relationship between the congregation and the elders. And the first thing we see is that the congregations, we see the congregation's posture toward the elders. Look here in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 12 and 13. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace 
among yourselves. So we see several things here in this passage. And, you know, Paul is writing about the, the leaders in the church. And again, he uses this word, um, it says they're over you. We looked at that word um, last time. It's they're, they're ruling over you. And we explained what all that meant. But what's the congregation's responsibility here? Well, the first thing is, is they're told to respect them, respect the elders. Um, the word really, it just means to acknowledge them. A acknowledge that the elders are the leaders, they are the men whom God has placed in authority over you, and, and therefore you're to acknowledge them, you're to respect them, give them the respect due to them. And, and it's interesting that he... he you know, we're, we're talking here about a plurality of godly leadership, as we've pointed out throughout these messages, right? It, it's, it should be a respect for all of them. Those who labor, esteem them, their work. It's talking, not talking about one person leading the congregation. It's not talking about one man. It's talking about a plurality of godly leadership. And, you know, sometimes when, you know, especially in, in a larger church, when there's, you know, when you do have, a, and, and even in our, in our church here, if we, when we go forward and have a, a, a plurality of elders, you know, the temptation might be to, to respect some of them. And, and that's got to be guarded against, Right? I mean, in the future, we'll deal with this. If, if somebody is, is in a position of elder and he's not doing what he should do, if he's, if he's abusing his position or not doing what he should do as an elder, then there are the ways to, to deal with that. But all the elders need to be respected. All of them. And they are to be respected for their work. It says they labor among you. They labor on behalf of the church. And this labor consists of, of two elements, right? They're over you. That's the, the element that we've, we've already seen, both of these elements. They're, they're ruling, they're managing the church, and they're doing so in the Lord. Their authority is in the Lord. He also says here, in this verse, not only do they um, are over you, but also they admonish you. Again, remember, we, we saw this word last time. It's the word used in Acts 20, 31. To admonish. They, they call to attention the spiritual truth that one should be thinking about and submitting to. And again, this goes under the, under the broad heading of shepherding. So Paul here is mentioning these two areas again, the two, the two main functions of an elder, to oversee and to shepherd. Now you think about the two ways specifically mentioned here in this passage that elders labor among the congregation, ruling and admonishing. Did you ever notice some people don't like oversight? Any of you who have ever had any kind of leadership position in the church or secular, you know, if you've been a boss, supervisor, you, you understand this, right? Some people don't like oversight. They don't want anyone to manage anything that they're involved in. They can get along just fine, making their own decisions and, and, and doing what they want to do. And, of course, this can be a huge challenge for anyone in leadership and it can be a huge challenge for elders who are trying to fulfill their responsibility their biblical responsibility of giving oversight that's one of the one of the things they're called right they're they're shepherds they're elders they're overseers well if giving oversight causes trouble sometimes for people admonition causes even more trouble. It's generally the same people that don't like the oversight that don't like the admonition. Um, listen to what one author wrote because 
um, this is from a, a commentary from over, I believe, about 100 years ago. And um, listen to what he says. He says, we are certain to bring a good deal of the world into the church without knowing it. We are certain to have instincts, habits, dispositions, associates perhaps, and likings which are hostile to the Christian type of character. And it is this which makes admonition indispensable. But we should remember that as Christians we are pledged to a course of life which is not in all ways natural, to a spirit and conduct which are incompatible with pride, to a seriousness of purpose, to a loftiness and purity of aim, which may all be lost through willfulness. And we should love and honor those who put their experience at our service and warn us when, in lightness of heart, we are on the way to make shipwreck of our life. They do not admonish us because they like it, but because they love us and would save us from harm. T take note of that last thing he says here. He's talking about elders, those who are in spiritual leadership, those who are giving oversight, those who are, are preaching and teaching, admonishing. He says, they do not admonish us because they like it, because, but because they love us and would save us from harm. Um, granted, I think I've met a few people who... who like to admonish people. I've met a few people who just like to get in people's face and, you know, I mean, they're out there, right? You, you, you've met them as well. But for most of us, myself included, this is not the thing, you know, I wake up in the morning and I say, <laughs> who can I admonish today? You know, that, that's, that's not how we live. You know, it, and, and there's a lot of care and a lot of prayer that goes into this ministry of admonishing. And um, again, it can, it can be a, a real problem because most people don't, I say most people, a lot of people, even in the church, don't welcome admonition. But the congregation is to respect the elders for the work of overseeing and pastoring, shepherding, that they do for them. We also see here that a second thing that the congregation needs to do is esteem the elders highly in love. You see it there in verse 13, and to esteem them, again plural, very highly in love because of their work. So the to esteem just means to regard, to have an opinion. And the opinion that the congregation should have is, is a very high one. The congregation should, should esteem the elders very highly. In other words, most exceedingly. And, and they should do so in love. Well, why? Why should the congregation esteem the elders very highly in love? Because of their giftedness? Because the elder's a great preacher? He's a great teacher? Because he's well-educated? Because, because they like his personality? Or they like his humor? No. No. Why? It tells us, right? Because of their work. You see it? It's seeing them very highly in love because of their work. Because of their work. Because, because of their ruling over. Because of their admonishing. Because they're overseeing and shepherding. Again, I want to read from a different commentary this time. Because I think, I, I think that, you know, if you're, a, if you're a pastor, you're an elder, you know, you might think you're the only one that, experiences this or thinks thinks this way but but just you know I think he he speaks for a lot of um, men who have exercised oversight and shepherding you know of a congregation listen to what he says our natural tendency is to take our leaders for granted forget what they have done for us complain rather than be thankful Accentuate the bad and disregard the good. For example, 
God gave Israel some of the greatest leaders in human history, men like Moses and David. Yet during difficult times, the people were ready in a moment to stone both Moses and David. Due to our basic ingratitude and complaining spirit, the scripture exhorts us to highly honor our spiritual leaders, to esteem them very highly. And Paul adds the beautiful and comprehensive phrase, in love. We usually emphasize the importance of church shepherds loving the people, and that is necessary, but here Paul turns the tables and charges the people to love their shepherds. To Paul, love is the divine glue that holds the leaders and the congregation together through all the disagreements and hurts of congregational life. No group of elders is perfect. All elders have weaknesses, and each believer has a unique perspective on how elders should operate. As a result, there is always some degree of tension between leaders and followers. Even the best elders are inevitably accused of pride, wrong judgment, doing too much or too little, moving too slowly or too quickly, changing too much or not enough, and being too harsh or too passive. As commentator E.J. Bricknell observes, the exercise of authority is always apt to provoke resentment. Difficult situations arise in which leaders cannot avoid angering some part of the congregation. Conflict between leaders and the led can at times become severe. Again, any of you who have had any kind of supervisory position wherever you are, and I look around and I, I, I know there are quite a few of you in here who have done that, you understand from your own experience what he's talking about, what he's saying here. And, and I think he's absolutely right, even in a church situation. You know, there, you've got elders who are leading and they are not always going to do things exactly like every member of the congregation thinks they should. They're far from perfect. And even though they may be acting perfectly in a situation, the most perfectly, they, the best they can at least, um, you know, there, there's going to be people in a congregation that are going to say, you know, he really blew this. He didn't do this right. He should have done this. He should have done that. You know, it shouldn't have been this way. I mean, that's just human nature, right? That's the way it is. And that's why Paul says here, you know, he, he, he says here, and we'll look at some other passages, not, not, not today, we don't have time, but, but they are to be respected. They are to be esteemed very highly because of their work. And, and again, you know, there are a lot of Christian people sitting in churches who, who do this. You know, it doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't have, there doesn't have to be conflict. There doesn't have to be this, this you know, rebellion, this, this repelling of the leadership of the elders. Again, if the elders are out of line or an elder is out of line, there, there's a biblical way to deal with that. And, and we'll, Lord willing, get to that next time. But, you know, it doesn't have to be this way. And I think for the most part it isn't. You know, I look back at, well, I was in Brazil as a missionary, pastoring there, um, pastoring here, you know, and really it's, it's a relatively small percentage of people that give the problems to the leadership. And I'm not saying, of course, that the leadership is always, you know, in the right because they're not perfect. But... This is what Paul's dealing with here. There, there, there has to be this, on the congregation's part, they have to, the, the, the respect, the esteem given to the elders in love is, is based upon, of course, it's, it's all based in Christ, but, but it's based upon their work, their work, what they are doing. And their work is overseeing and shepherding. So the first thing of importance in the congregation's relationship to the elders is respecting and esteeming very highly the elders in love. 
the, the best thing a congregation can do for its leaders is to love them. To love them. Because love suffers long. Love covers a multitude of sin. But the second responsibility really is a direct outflow out of the first. And it's because a congregation respects and highly esteems their elders in love that they will honor them and provide for their material needs. And that's the second point this morning. The, the congregation's provision for the elders' material needs. Look with me over at 1 Timothy chapter 5. It's, it's there on the screen. We've read this several times. Um, we'll read it again here. 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. So we see here that Paul says that let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor. Well, before we talk about double honor, let's just talk about honor. Honor. Honor, it just means to place a, a value on, to access, its, access the worth of something. And so all elders are, are you know, it's really tied in with the respect and esteeming them highly. It's, 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 it's that kind of honor. Because of who they are, because of what they're doing, because God has placed them in this position, they're due honor. They, they have value. But then he, he mentions double honor. And really this is, as we'll see here as we study it out, it's talking about financial remuneration. It's talking about, you know, making sure the elder, certain elders, that their financial needs are met. We saw that last time some of the elders devote their labors to the teaching and preaching side of the elder ministry. Uh, these elders were supported financially by their churches to shepherd and to oversee them. And Paul is saying that those who devote themselves to an extensive ministry of preaching and teaching should be considered worthy of double honor. And as we see here in the context, it's speaking of being provided for financially for their material needs here in verse 18 Paul quotes from Deuteronomy and what he's saying is is the elder who is laboring in the in the word and the teaching and preaching who's laboring on behalf of the congregation deserves his wages now let's just look at the present day situation where we are because Things have changed, right? 2,000 years since this was written. But in our day, many churches have a plurality of elders. And in almost all of those churches, some of the elders are men who work secular jobs and minister in the church as overseers and shepherds. They, they make a great sacrifice. They're, they're working. They have their regular employment. But they're also spending a lot of time in the church in this overseeing and shepherding ministry. Also, in, in most of the churches that have a plurality of elders, there's, there's one elder or more than one elder, usually depending on the size of the church, who are financially remunerated for their work as an elder. And, of course, we know that the word elder is synonymous with pastor. Um, but So all elders are pastors, but generally churches refer to those elders who are on a, a paid staff of the church, they refer to them as pastors. I'm just saying this is, this is the common practice here in America in our day. And, and these are the ones who usually receive the financial remuneration. They, they are dedicating their, their life, their full time, to oversee and shepherd in the church. And before we go any further here, you know, I, I just want to say I, I'm very thankful to the Lord and, and to you as a church family 
that you take good care of me in this regard financially. Um, when I began pastoring here years ago, the church had very little money. Um, they paid me literally a, a couple hundred dollars a week. And I, and I continued working in my secular job of selling real estate that I had started doing after returning from Brazil. And once the church got to the place where they could pay me enough to, to stop selling real estate, then I did. And I devoted my full attention to, to the ministry here. And since that time, um, you as a church have been very generous to me, and, and I do greatly appreciate it. I'm very thankful to the Lord for that and, and thankful to you. So obviously anything I say this morning is not said in any kind of rebuke. It's, it, it's just scriptural teaching that the church needs. And, and really, as I said, much of what we're doing here in some of these, these changes we're making is, is really making sure we have the right establishment, the right foundation for the future. And the next, next pastor who comes along. So while we're dealing with this matter of financial remuneration for the pastor, I, I want to take a few minutes to just see what the scriptures say about a church financially supporting their pastor. And as I noted, Paul quotes here from the law in Deuteronomy in support of the church providing for its pastor. So, so let's just begin there. There's this general principle that the laborer is worthy of his hire. In Deuteronomy chapter 25 and verse 4, we read, you shall not muzzle an ox when it is treading out the grain. In other words, here, here you've got this animal, he's working for you, he's, he's, he's doing this work, and, and he needs to eat. You, you don't cause him so he can't eat. You, you let him eat. You, you provide for him. It's an animal he's talking about. But, you know, as Paul will say, and we'll see here later, it, it wasn't written, the main purpose of that law wasn't for animals, it's for people. And, it, and you see in the law in Leviticus 19, 13, you shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired worker shall not remain with you all night until the morning. Of course, it was a different society, you know, that was agricultural. These people... We talk about living paycheck to paycheck. Well, these people lived day to day. They needed to get paid. These general laborers working in the, in the fields and such needed to be paid at the end of the day so they could buy bread the next morning for their family. And, and the principle here is that the laborer is worthy of his hire. You don't withhold what is due the laborer. And we see this principle applied in the Old Testament to priests and, and temple workers. Again, back in there are many, many references we could look at, but just in, in Deuteronomy 18, the first five verses, I'll just read these verses so you get an idea here of what's going on. The Levitical priest, all the tribe of Levi, shall have no portion or inheritance with Israel. They shall eat the Lord's food, food offerings as their inheritance. They shall have no inheritance among their brothers. The Lord is their inheritance as he promised them. And this shall be the priest's due from the people. From those offering a sacrifice, whether an ox or a sheep, they shall give to the priest the shoulder and the two cheeks and the stomach, the first fruits of your grain, of your wine, and of your oil, and the first fleece of your sheep you shall give him. For the Lord your God has chosen him out of all your tribes to stand and minister in the name of the Lord, him and his sons for all time. So you see that in the Old Testament economy where you know God was dealing through the nation of Israel, uh, those who were working in the temple, those who were ministering to the people as priests and temple workers, they were provided for by the people. Some of these offerings and such that they would bring were to go to meet the needs of of those who were ministering in the name of the Lord. And when we come to the New Testament, we see the same thing. We see the same principle applied to New Testament preachers of the gospel. 
Um, you have Jesus' instruction to his disciples in Matthew 10, 9 and 10. He's sending them out. He says, acquire no guilt, excuse me, no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or saddles of a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. And again in Luke chapter 10 and verse 2, he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And then in verse 7 he says, as he's given them instructions going on, he says, remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. So Jesus taught this principle. Um, you, you come to the apostles, and, and Paul makes this lengthy. Let, let's just turn over there, 1 Corinthians 9, and, and, and listen to what Paul says here um, concerning, concerning the apostles. He's speaking of himself here. Look at verse 3 of 1 Corinthians 9. He says, this is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? In other words, don't we have the right to, to eat and drink at, at your expense, is what he's saying. Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Does he not certainly speak for our sake? It was written for our sake because the plowman should plow in hope and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, do not we even more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. So Paul takes these Old Testament passages, some of which we just briefly looked at, and he says, look, this is, this is, this is how God operates. This is, this is how God works. And he says this applies to the New Testament workers as well, that those who preach the gospel should be living by the gospel. But, but you know, Paul's writing to the, to the Corinthians there in You'll know that there, there were times when Paul, of course, he, he was a tent maker, right? So he goes in and he, you know, it's just meaning that he's, he's doing, he's working with leather, apparently what his skill was. And, and he's making money because he doesn't want, he doesn't want to um, be a stumbling block. He doesn't want people to think he's just there trying to get their money, but he's preaching the gospel to them. Um, in fact, he, he says, right, he says in 1 Thessalonians 2.9, um, he says, For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil, we work night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. And, and you know, there are people out there that say, oh, you know, and, and there are churches that, that have, um, most of them, I think, that, that think this way, have an elder board. They have men who are on the elders, elder board, but none of them are paid. They just, they're just, they work jobs and they come and they, and they do this. And, and one of their arguments is, you know, you got, you got to be like Paul. You got to be like a tent maker. Um, some people will say, well, somebody's going to go be a missionary. You know, they, they need to be a tent maker. They need to go, go there and get work and, and spread the gospel. This is what Paul did. Uh, well, that, that's a nice thought. But, but here's the problem with it. You know, Paul wasn't getting money from the Thessalonian church. Apparently he wasn't getting money from the Corinthian church. But you know what church he was getting money from? The Philippian church. 
Look, look at what he says here in Philippians 4, 15 through 16. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. So Paul says, hey, I was in Thessalonica. I, I was working because I, I didn't want to be a stumbling block to anybody. But, but the whole time, at least at times, Philippian, the Philippian church is sending him money. They're supporting him because the church at Thessalonica wasn't. Of course, it was a church, new church planning situation. The church at Corinth wasn't. In fact, Paul says to the Philippians, you were the only ones. So, again, Paul was still receiving help, financial help, material help, you know, from a church, even though he was laboring in another church and receiving nothing from that church. So this same principle applies to pastors. This is the verse we just looked at in 1 Corinthians 9, 14. The Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. And, 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 and he's referring back to Jesus' words. This is what the Lord Jesus said when he sent his disciples out. And of course in Galatians 6, 6, Paul writes to them, Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. And the word share here is the idea of, of it, it's speaking of material things. Um, you know, which brings us back to 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. So what does the New Testament say about the financial responsibility that a church has to its pastor? Well, to put it basically in biblical terms, the pastor as a laborer is worthy of his hire. The pastor as a preacher of the gospel should make his living of the gospel. We saw the church as hearers of the word should share with the pastor who teaches them the word. And the church should count the pastor who rules well and teaches the word to be worthy of double honor, which is a reference to financial remuneration. And, and you know, here, it, it just, the, these are just principles, right, taught in the scripture, from, from, from the law all the way to the New Testament church. And so, you know, every local church has to apply this. Um, and how, how do you apply it? Well, the church should make sure they're doing their best to, to meet the needs of the pastor and his family. Um, and sometimes the church is unable, as it was when I came here to, to take this church. It's unable to provide for the pastor as they should. And, you know, maybe the pastor has to work a, a secular job and, until, you know, he's, the church is able to support him. But, again, I've seen this over the years. I, I have seen pastors who have worked a secular job, and, and, and it's very it's very difficult to oversee and, and um, shepherd a church of any size, you know, when you're, when you're working 40 hours a week at another job. Um, it's probably easier in your 20s or 30s maybe, but then you, you really, it, it's even difficult then, but obviously as you get a little older, you, you don't have as much steam. <laughs> um, but, but anyway, it, it's, a lot of times these churches, what, what, what I've seen is, is they see their pastor and, and, and he's working a secular job and, and he's getting along just fine. You know, maybe the church really isn't doing that well, but, you know, at least you got a pastor and, and, and there's never any encouragement for him by increasing his wages or, or helping him come along so he can go full time. And, and again, it's, these are all things that have to be weighed out and, and they should be remedied as soon as possible. Um, and as the church grows, the, the pastor's salary should increase until it, it is where it should be. You know, and again, I, I'm thankful for this church because they, that's what 
our church has done. I mean, we not only, and I, I, I set, I, I asked the church to do this and they did. Um, we increased the missionaries um, support as we increased the pastor's salary. And, and I think that was a good way to do it, and, and God honored that. Um, but there's all sorts of questions, right? How much should the pastor be paid? What benefits should he get? And, and you know, there, there's just all these cultural and, and regional factors that, that weigh in on that. Um, and and I, I really think, you know, it has to be worked out in any church. Um, but I, I think overall the, the idea here is that the church should be as generous as possible to their pastor. I'm not talking about paying him some exuberant amount of money so he's you know, making more than, than everyone else, but, but really, you know, how do you determine a salary? Well, there are, there are a lot of different ways to determine salaries. There are actually church organizations, parachurch organizations that, that weigh this out. How much should a, a pastor, how much does the average pastor in a certain area of the country, you know, how much does he earn? What's his wages? And, you know, what are the benefits? And, and I think a good way to do it is, you know, you, you look at the congregation. You know, if, if your congregation's average income is $30,000 a year, then you don't want to pay the pastor 75000 right? You're probably not going to be able to, first of all. But if, you, if, you're, if the average salary of your congregation is one hundred and Fifty thousand dollars a year, you, know, you you probably shouldn't be paying your pastor fifty thousand. I mean, a rule of thumb is the, you know that, the, a, a good rule of thumb is that the, the median of the church member's salary. I mean, again, but these things are all things that have to be, they're practical things that have to be worked out. Um. So, again, like I said, this is. Not, far from any kind of um, reproof or rebuke because you all have, have really um, taken good care of me and we've been able to increase our missions giving and, and the Lord has blessed us very much in this, in this area. But just let's wrap it up here. The, the congregation is to respect the elders and highly esteem them in love and they are to provide for the material needs of the elder or elders who devote their lives to specifically preaching and teaching. And, and I just want you to, to note once again, and I think this is important, we don't really have time to focus in on it, but if you look at the end of 1 Thessalonians 2.13, he says, be at peace among yourselves. And, and really the way to peace in a local church is is to have elders who are faithfully, scripturally overseeing and shepherding the local church in a congregation who is respecting and highly esteeming and love those elders. And, you know, that, that's, that's what the scriptures put forth. And if, if either one goes astray, the elders or the congregation or, or, or certain ones in the congregation, generally how it is, then, you know, that, that needs to be dealt with. And again, Lord willing, next time we'll, we'll look at that. But um, again, just really straightforward teaching here regarding um, biblical eldership and um, probably a lot of it most of you already are familiar with. But um, I think it's something that we need to just go over and um, lay the foundation going forward. Father, thank you for your word. May it find lodging in our minds and in our hearts. And may you continue to guide our church as we seek to honor you in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen.